the Department of Building and Civil Engineering in here in GMIT. And I just want to go through um, a project we have called the BIM Futures Project. This was funded by the National Forum for Teaching, Learning and Enhancement in Higher Education. And its main aim is to develop a professional development framework for staff, students and industry. But today I'm going to particularly talk about staff and students. And it's like what Avril said, what role can we play? And the key word there, I suppose, is leading the transition, if, if we can, or at least support industry who are leading that transition. That's the overarching aim of all of us, I think, in, in the higher education sector, and specifically in this um, research project. So, if we look at the construction sector, as many of you know, direct employment is 150,000 people coming up on. Um, if we look at the higher edu education sector of that though, we see that 11% of all undergraduates and graduates are in, uh, involved in engineering, manufacturing and construction. So that's a huge potential that's leaving. So you see students coming from ourselves, to U Dublin, Waterford. Now there's a big cohort of students and as was said earlier, they're going to be the innovators and the change makers really in the industry. Okay, they're going to support the people who are already in the industry. So there's huge potential. Our background, I suppose, is like any industry and it's, we're sort of preaching to the converted here today because everybody has sort of been people, if you like. But GMIT first started in, on this journey back in 2012, working with Kerry Building Contractors on a research project that was looking at building information modeling with Gerard Nicholson um, on an SME project. Um, so that sort of led into collaborations with JG Rashigan, looking at industry focused workshops, and then finally, sort of a, a partnership that has developed since 2014 and 15 with the RPS group. And just to bring you through that, so Jim O'Connor and George Nicholson led the way on this. They were the innovators within our department. Michelle Fahey with JJ Radigans was an innovator in industry. We had Paul Carey and with Mark Costello from RPS and Careys. And it was that small group of people that started the journey on, on the suite of courses we have at the moment. So it doesn't take a huge amount of people, it just takes a small amount of people who have a focus and a bit of foresight of what might be the potential of these things to start, to start the ball rolling. And so if you go through sort of the, the chronologically of where we are, I'll read them out, but you see we started, George started delivering a springboard certificate back in 2012, we had the research project, and then that evolved into the higher diploma in engineering in BIM. It was designed, it was piloted with industry, it was co-designed with industry, it was led by Jim and Gerard, working with Mark Costa and RPS, and so it was like a bespoke, flexible, industry-focused program. And so, you know, that would be enough you, you, at, at a certain stage, but you want to keep expanding. So that informed RPS themselves. We tried to expand the diploma to bring it to a more, a more broader audience. It informed the RPS BIM Technical Services Study. So Jerry Carty earlier on today, and the first speaker went through a lot of these things. Um, but it also informed industry-focused workshops where we had industry coming in to GMIT to get you know, specific training. In 2015 and 2016, we offered it industry-wide. RPS, it was part of the RPS certification by the BRE. And in 2008, 2019, as Avril mentioned about Springboard funding, Springboard funding and has been a great enabler for this area. We got Springboard funding in the area to develop it in a blended mode or a blended model. So at currently, we have 50 students on the course and we had, that was the max we could take. We had 50 more on a waiting list. It's delivered 75% online 25 percent face to face so every second week they come in for a one four hour workshop the rest of the material is delivered online so that's a challenge for us in in higher education but it's been working really well at the moment and just like the other presentations we're trying to track um, how that influences student learning and how effective it is <clears throat> so the thing about um Terry Carty presented it this morning about a number of awards and stuff. It's not actually the awards that matter, really. It's the way you cement your relationship with industry. So we're sort of very proud of our close relationship with industry. And so what this does is these awards are obviously a boost for the people that were involved in the program, but they're also gets the message across, across the department because you have a small amount of people maybe dealing with it and they're seen as sort of you're the BIM people over there. But this, a department gets awarded this, you know, it reflects the department, the head of the department gets interested, the head of school gets interested, the president gets interested when you start picking up awards. So, and from an industry point of view, they can use these for their tender submissions. So it is sort of a win-win uh, 
process. <coughs> um, so we won several awards, as Jerry mentioned earlier, but one I suppose that was the most relevant for me from a higher education point of view was the Delta Award, and we were the inaugural engineering winner of that. And that's awarded by the National Forum, and it rewards disciplinary excellence. But what it actually did as part of the process, you had to set out a three-year plan of where you were going. So that was really useful, there was a lot of work in it, but it was really useful in to see this is how, what we're going to do. So what we're trying to do now, and it informed the funding for this research project, is actually roadmap what we plan to do and follow that through. And I think we have in a, a number of ways. That's just a video about it. So again, with the award, Delta de delivered a video on it. And again, you might say, well, that's nice. I'm not going to roll it here now because it's, it's quite a basic video. But as a marketing tool for students, for schools, it demonstrates, well, here's GMIT or TU Dublin or anywhere. Here's what they're doing, and here's an award that they won. So it's, it's a sort of a structured approach. So again, all of this wasn't the only reason that RPS achieved their accreditation, but it certainly helped looking at the transformational CPD approach. So again, there's wind benefits for industry have been involved in it, and it's, it's, it's not unusual, but it, it's, it's very important to keep that link and to keep that partnership going on. So as RPS or the other companies are evolving, we start to evolve. So it's great to have a direct line with industry that can say to us, well, actually, this may be a gap in your curriculum. You should look at this, or we'll develop this module. That sort of synergy. So programmatic reviews happen every five years. You bring in industry, you have workshops, and you, and you move on. But things are out of date so quickly now that you need that direct line with industry so that we can keep <coughs> sort of innovating. Okay, so again, this supported RPS and their accreditation for ISO 1960 50, And also, it has certain perks for people who get to fly off to Las Vegas to do the Autodesk University. But again, it's not that they're in Las Vegas, but it's that there was an industry and an academic person, academic slash industry person, together presenting at an event. That, that's very important as well. But from our point of view, what, what I choose, because I would be not a BIM person, I'm not a software person, I sort of was asked to get involved in this, so I like, like the process and I want to put a research framework around it. So we have developed this sort of reciprocal learning model as a research fr framework, and the idea of that is industry best practice should inform curriculum, create, cre research should inform industry best practice, which should inform curriculum, and so there's all these synergies that you pull together. So if we're doing research in the BIM area, it has to be about a, a, a topic that's useful to the industry. It's not a theoretical abstract thing, we're trying to keep it very practical. And as part of a higher diploma in BIM, and at the moment I'm wafting through 50 research proposals, but the advice in all of them is focus on something you're doing in your day-to-day -day job. Focus on a problem you see in industry, as everyone mentioned, and look at a tangible output from it. You know, not an academic output as, as such, but a tangible thing that you can go back to your company and say, I did this research project over six or seven months, and here's what I think, here's the solution, or at least a plan towards the solution. And that reduces the workload for the students, but also gives them something practical, because they're not all coming from academic backgrounds, which is important to stress. So industry needs versus graduate outcomes. So one of the focuses I had on this when I was applying for the funding for this research project was how do you ensure that academic staff have the competencies to facilitate students to have certain graduate outcomes that the industry needs? And the non-BIM, for want of a better word, staff. So we have a good cohort within our department, but they're okay. They're leading the BIM. It's the rest of the modules that you see and the rest of the staff. How can we bring them along with us? So you need to work backwards, actually. You need to see what does industry need, how does this inform our learning outcomes, and then to see, well, what can we do to facilitate staff with CPD or training or advice or mentoring or whatever so that we can bring them along. And so we're taking a quite a sort of incremental approach and a softly, softly approach. If you have to tell people to do it, you're going to get a bad reaction. So you bring them along with you. So it's looking at all of these different areas. Um, so these are three of the main aims, as I mentioned, but it's, we call it capacity building. So what academic staff, I think, need is they actually need a suite of resources. Okay, they can provide training for them and they can go to the training and they walk away and they may never use it. But if you provide a suite of resources from them, you're making it a lot, of, a lot easier for them. So if you put a framework around that, then you're going to get feedback on how well it worked, like the paper about the collaborative module, how well it worked, what the students taught, what the staff taught, and so on. 
So as I said, you're working back. But in the literature, from a research again, hat on, there isn't a huge amount on academic staff skills and competencies. There's a good bit about what industry needs, there's a good bit about learning outcomes and all that stuff, but it's the staff within the institutes of technology and the universities, and the technological universities, that are facilitating this. So I absolutely loved your thing where you brought all the staff together and had different disciplines, brilliant timetable in Alaska afterwards, how <laughs> you managed to do that, but it, it, it's a brilliant idea, bringing multidisciplinary people across, and even we could do that and bringing people who aren't usually involved into the mix, and then hopefully they will sort of buy into it later on. So we're going to try and do it quite simply as part of the project, so the project only commenced in March, so we're sort of going through the literature sections of it now at the moment, but as I said, we're working back at this, what are the industry needs, what are the professional bodies, that informs a grad, so we're undergoing a programmatic review this year, that will uh, inform the graduate competencies, and that in turn will inform what they need. So whether you're looking at BIM from a role point of view, an activity <coughs> point of view, a task point of view, there's lots of options, you know, you take a different approach to each one. But they are key, obviously it's what industry wants and what the, and the uh, professional bodies wants. And the professional bodies should be, if they are, responding to what industry wants. But the industry is, is leading it, so we need to be able to react and be responsive to it. <coughs> now, and I, I was talking earlier on to someone about this, that the competency is an interesting term. So when you say, if you say somebody is competent, it's usually a universal term or a holistic term. You can have a competent driver or an incompetent driver, but for, from a point of view with this is you're looking at knowledge, skills, abilities, and I think two of the most important things are behaviors and attitude. And like you can be lacking knowledge in an area, but you can have the right attitude toward, right behavior toward, and you'll pick up the knowledge. It's harder to change behaviors and attitudes as we've seen in the industry. The culture change is quite difficult, so you're trying to look at all of these aspects to it. <coughs> so, Assessing and benchmarking is very important. So how are we going to go about it? Well, we've sort of started the process, but it's not really going to kick off until um, October because September is such a busy month. We're developing a sort of uh, a digital badge framework for academic staff. We're going to have different levels within it, and they have to achieve different things within it. So for a basic level, for instance, we're setting up a BIM Byte series. We're inviting the different phases in to do talks every two weeks. That's predominantly for the student, future students, but it's also for staff. And so we're going to bring in local authority, very friends coming in on the 7th of October, then we'll have a client, then we'll have a design team, then we'll have a project manager, then we'll have main contractors and so on, to show staff and students the whole sort of remit of the different supply chains. And those talks have sort of two aims. One is their own personal journey, so the individual who has given to talk about their own sort of BIM journey or digital journey, but also what does a client like Dublin County Council need from a BIM point of view, what's their requirement, and then how does the design team respond to that, and so on. So the idea about that is if staff attend those talks, that they'll be able to get credit for that, and that, that might lead to the basic one, and then we'll have another level where they use some resources in class, that'll be intermediate, and then another resource will go to advance where they do a course, or develop a course around the BREAG, and then expert, we haven't got the expert yet, let's get to basic first, but that's sort of the idea. And that will be aligned with a plan of work for the, for the staff this year. And it will be based around the National Forum, have a nice sort of template of CPD for higher education staff generally, not just in the construction sector. And you can be down as a mentor, a leader, learn, you know, things you have new learning or consolidated learning. So you may have a very good Revit experience, but not so much BIM 260 experience or something like that. So I'm predominantly focusing on the process and culture change, so you have the people and the process, and we have the BIM people who can focus on the software as well, and we try and marry all of them together. <coughs> so as I mentioned, the BIM Byte series, we're also going to have digital, digital demos, so we're bringing in a lot of the, the suppliers with the laser scans and drone surveys and all that to show the students, but when they're in showing the students as part of that, we're going to set aside a, a sort of demonstration for the staff as well. Obviously, it's an advantage to the company because you know they're buying uh, equipment and so on. But again, to show the staff what's what's out there and what's available, um, because that's very important. <coughs> we already have the BRE BMAG program embedded into our Level A programs, and we're trying to look at that and see if we adjust that as a staff CPD as well. Uh, and 
that's something that will probably happen, say, in the, when the class is finished from April to June, to give staff an opportunity to do workshops. That material is all online and it's supplemented by workshops. So again, if you wanted to move to the advanced level, say, you would have to complete um, that course. So again, you're just given options. As was mentioned earlier, all of these resources will be there. So if the staff don't do it this year, well, maybe they'll drop in again next year and complete it. So it doesn't have to be done within any one year or anything like that. <clears throat> so if we are successful in that, the other thing that's very interesting, and it's an area that TU Dublin and others might look at, with the BREAG program, if the students get an average of 70% in their mark, they're on to the BRE Acceleration or Individual Certificate Program. We want to look at how do we support that framework. So how do we help them? So they leave, they're working away for three years, and then it's like chartership, they want to go for their certification. How, as an institute, can we support that? And a lot of that is all of these resources are going to be online. There's going to be things built around it, and maybe we can use that, have a double sort of um, use for those materials with their, that can support the students. It'll also give a direct line, feedback line, between our graduates and the college. Okay, because traditionally the graduates go, you keep in touch, but it's usually down on an individual basis. There's no structure to it. I think it's vital that we keep a structured approach to our graduates because they're the ones learning probably faster than we are because they're learning on the job so we need to get that feedback loop so obviously the BIM world skills you know winning the BIM world skills with Waterford and, and uh, TU Dublin was fantastic but that's just a way of doing things having a world skills having the hackathons having student competitions disrupts the way we teach and I think the more we have that stuff I can guarantee you as you talk to a student five years after they leave college, they're not going to remember the class they did on a Thursday at 3 to 4, but they're going to remember going to Russia for the BIM World Skills. They're going to remember doing the hackathon in Dublin for a weekend where they stayed overnight and had the crack with their friends and so on. And people say, well, that's a social thing. It's not. It's an educational thing. You have to make it enjoyable. So if it is enjoyable... And we, yeah. <laughs> so if it's enjoyable, you know, they learn a lot more. The thing with the funding from the National Forum, they have an open education policy. So they want every resource to be open educational. So the idea with this is when we start populating the resorts, we'll be sending out invites to all our partners who want to submit resources or just use the resources. Because we're not going to be able to develop, we don't have the capacity to develop every resource for every element. So the idea is that you would have something that would support a sort of national educational framework in BIM and digital and so on. Just in good construction, we have to move away from sort of the BIM terminology as well a little bit. Um, <clears throat> linking to what Ava said as well about people presenting here today um, from TU Dublin, we did this a number of years ago, but we're going to start it off again, where we have, we'll have a BIM Futures Research Journal for the students. So if we have 50 submissions, we'll have you know, the top 10, and we'll hold a uh, BIM hub around that. And, publicise it and distribute it, but I did this previously on a master's programme in environmental systems and all the students came back to me when I met them afterwards, after they graduated, and said they actually used it for their, for their interviews. So they had a you know, concise thing when they're going for the interviews, they wanted evidence of the work. No employer is going to read a 100-page dissertation, but they will read a 5-7 page research journal. And that shows them that they did, that's their own independent work. So these outputs are easily done. Okay, and they have great sort of impact later on. Also, we're very conscious that it's not just about BIM, so we're looking at digital citizenship workshops, just about the whole area of digital, especially in first year. You know, behavior with social media, all that sort of stuff is very important to raise that digital fluency and awareness very early, and then progress on to the other aspects. So it's not fully finished, but to give staff what, what you want, you want to give them something that's familiar to them. So staff are familiar going in on Moodle is our VLR, VLE, sorry, and they're used to going into their own modules, looking at their own weeks and so on. So what we're looking at the structure around this is that we would focus it around the program first, then look at the different years, and then actually go into the individual modules. And it's not to say that each individual module is going to be populated with BIM or digital construction related resources. It won't be, because some won't be relevant. But the ones that will be, you'll see that there's a suite of resources. So you're not just giving them a video, you're giving them a lesson plan, you're giving them assessment, a feedback rubric, some background information, slides. So there's a suite, take that, try it out, and come back to us and tell us how well it worked. 
And so that people who don't have any idea of BIM may be more willing to use those resources than people who know, know BIM very well. And even the people who know BIM very well will use the resources as well. So that's the plan this time next year. I'll tell you if it worked or not. Um, but that's sort of the structure we're looking to see um, how we can bring them along. Also chatting to Elizabeth O'Brien earlier on from LIT and TU Dublin and Barry O'Callie to do from a research perspective the BIM CERT project up in Dublin and the BIM Z project down in LIT directly links in from a competency point of view to what we're doing in the BIM Futures project. So there is a huge opportunity from a research point of view and I don't know if they're going to announce the Digital Centre of Excellence later on but that's an idea from a research point of view where you can pull all of this stuff together Okay, as an output. But the key aim is that the research is evidence-based so that it's useful to industry, not abstract, but evidence-based research. And you couple that with the good work by CISHA, and I know the National Building Council got a bit of a, a dig earlier on, but it's no harm, and pull all of those things together and suddenly you have you know, a hub of things that are happening in that area, which is very important. Ireland should be looking to be a, a world leader, you know, to be ambitious in this area. We saw what RPS are doing and the other companies that are doing, and they're making, you know, they've been recognised as a world leader. Higher education in Ireland, I think, is in a position to say to the rest of the world, well, we're a world leader in BIM. And when you're looking at internationalisation of higher education and international students and all of that stuff, which is a huge market, obviously, that's what we should be branding ourselves as. And so we need to have a sort of little more focus on that. <clears throat> so the, some questions is think, what would it look like on a national scale? So higher education is great at telling industry to collaborate. You should be collaborating. It's very important. We don't collaborate ourselves, really. We don't collaborate. We're all in competition with each other, but we don't collaborate a huge amount. We don't even collaborate sometimes within departments. So we'd have our silos of different programs and they don't meet together. And TU Dublin have done great work on that and sort of led the way in that. And Waterford has done a certain amount as well. But that's something that we're trying to encourage a lot more because obviously that's what industry needs to be. So if the students don't get a, a, a exposure to that in four years in college, how do they expect to work, work in that environment when they go out in the workplace? So there's a bit of sort of contradiction there. And as mentioned, it all you know, gives students time to experiment and trust them that they will experiment. We don't, we have sort of very congested timetables and we don't give people space. And it's only when they are doing hackathons and that sort of stuff where they have a two year, a two day dedicated slot that they start getting really creative. So that's important to free up the bit of space and a bit of time um, to look at the different possibilities. So this is an example. We are, we're proposing to build a new STEM building, and Gerald has been involved in the modelling of this. But why wouldn't our architectural students have been involved in the concept design, sending building and estates, different designs, different iterations of the design? When the design team is even appointed, why aren't architectural students working with them? Why couldn't the construction management students look at the buildability and constructability of the building, the site management of the building, civil engineers could be doing that? Why aren't the quantity surveying students looking at the cost estimates? Like we have a huge resource of students that could be doing real world work on a building that's proposed to be built. So a lot of the input here is coming from staff and it's the usual thing where you're just giving the design of the rooms and so on. But that would give a sort of dynamic learning environment for the student. It would be, it's really hard to do that. It's really difficult. There's lots of barriers to it, but it could be done. And imagine what a learning experience that would be for a student over a three year period, where they would go through all of those phases. And the other side of that is they would have a certain amount of ownership about the building then at the end. So there would be a certain amount of pride in it. So we really need to rethink things, I think, a little bit and get away from the totally structured elements of the building. Because we, have, we don't build a lot. TU Dublin is lucky, it's moving and it's all this development going on. But GMIT is a very small campus, or a multi campus. We don't have a huge amount of building going on. But the stuff we do do, as Everett said, needs to be a living lab. It needs to be a place to experiment for the students and the staff. <coughs> so the staff would learn a huge amount from this as well. And there's a risk you might expose your knowledge a little bit, but if you don't expose yourself a little bit, you're not going to learn. So that's me, I think. Thanks very much.